I was quite heavily in involved with Bjork's first album uh, in terms of string arrangements and beat making. Um, so from that point, you know, uh, she became a very, very close friend of mine. And, and then I, was, I helped put the band together because we had to go on tour and the album was pretty much made out of samples and you know um, strings but it was it was a difficult record to transpose uh, to translate on the stage in terms of technology and live playing so I, I helped with that I had, I called in a friend of mine Guy Zigsworth who's a wonderful musician amazing producer and uh, and few others and you know we got this band together and we we went on tour and that was the last bit of the kind of um, you know, me as a musician, as, as kind of, I suppose, that was a big change for me. You know, I stopped kind of doing sessions. I worked with Bjork. And then I started doing remixes uh, in the studio. And then from there, we, we ran a club um, at the Blue Note in Hoxton Square on a Monday night from 9.30 to 3 in the morning. Tuesday morning and we had this club night and so I was DJing and we were pretty much DJing our own material which we, we were making in the studio so um, you know the, it kind of expanded to a collective from me and a friend to another person so all of a sudden there's eight producers and we're all making music with, and rubbing shoulders and um, you know kind of getting inspired by each other and at that time, you know, uh, jungle music was really kind of, uh, it was really, you know, big in the kind of underground music world, in, especially around Hackney. And so the jungle beats, because they were pretty much jazz, uh, you know, drum beats, which were kind of then um, sped up, that really inspired me to kind of... Uh, to make some kind of dialogue with, with Indian music. Um, so the first early kind of those kind of uh, drum and bass experiments, I was sampling the Indian uh, classical records, voices and instruments, which didn't have beats. So they were slightly naked um, in terms of beatless. So we were taking phrases from those, um, you know, take uh, from those uh, records and then, you know, putting them into a kind of very droney type of like, you know, cloudy, beautiful uh, skyline pads. And, and then, in, you know, kind of um, juxtaposing that with, with all of those amazing jungle beats and, and heavy, um, minimal, low bass lines. And that became a new sound and a very, very exciting sound. And the whole of London, in terms of music lovers and, you know, SOAS students, St. Martin's fashion students, they were just loving what we were doing. And we would have like, you know, 400 people on a Monday night want to get into this club. And we were running that club for five, five years. Um, and that, you know, a, a compilation album called The Sounds of the Asian Underground was born out of that kind of, um, you know, that community, that kind of, that club. And that, they were exciting times. And then from there, as soon as that happened, I, I ended up signing to Island, Island Universal. And um, they had given me, you know, a, a quite reasonable budget to realise uh, my kind of debut album as an artist and um, so you know I had met well I was introduced to an engineer from Australia from Sydney who had come to London called Tristan Norwell and so he was like the appointed person who was going to help me make this record I was producing the record he was he was the engineer uh, engineer come mixer but I think he did much more than that it was a great collaboration so I can't just say he just did that you know, um, it's um, 
yeah, it was my vision and he really helped me. Um, he really helped me realize that in terms of technically. Um, and at times, all, you know, helping me organize the sessions and we had traveled to, um, to Japan, to the Okinawa Islands uh, to record um, an Okinawan girl band, folk girl band, which I was interested in called Nenas. And then we traveled, we spent a lot of time in Bombay recording master musicians, which I had, you know, relationship engagement with because of my uh, Indian percussion um, aspect. And, uh, and we, we recorded, you know, from string sections in Bombay and to, um, you know, Sarangi string players and, um, and then Bill Laswell on bass in New York. So we traveled around making this album and, uh, and I suppose it, the, the album was kind of, you know, it was almost two decades of, of kind of musical anthropology for me. It was, you know, learning about so many different styles of music. And then I had to put all of this into one album. And I think, you know, I, I think I did a good job of it. And it ended up winning, winning a few prizes, which is not a bad thing. Um, so it got realized, it got realized uh, by a whole diverse, um, you know, group of um, music lovers from all over the world. It was interesting because, you know, we were working on um, applications like Logic and Pro Tools. And most of the album we actually ended up tracking on radar, on a radar system, and which was advised by Tristan Norwell, my engineer. And it really worked well for us. It was very, very stable. Um, you know, it was an interesting time for me because I was kind of coming from more of a two-inch tape um, kind of production line. But I've been sequencing beats on on sequences from drum machines to Commodore 64, um, you know, Cubase, Logic. I've been doing that for many years. And so my digital side was pretty much like, you know, sequencing and making beats. Uh, in terms of recording on digital, that's always been, you know, kind of something which I never believed that you could do. And eventually we were doing it and, uh, and it didn't really bother me because I wasn't really the caretaker of that side. You know, my engineer was and he did a great job of administrating that. But when it came to 2002, I had set up a studio. I was out of my record contract. Um, I felt very, very abandoned by what we call the music industry after winning the Mercury Prize, I felt completely abandoned. And I, you know, luckily I was always, I always celebrated diversity in my career. So I was playing concerts everywhere. I was doing Indian classical concerts in India and doing, you know, a few ad things and film things and kind of getting by. So I had the studio in Saffron Hill at the Roundhouse Studios in the kind of diamond uh, district of London. And so I would go in that studio every day and I kind of um, started working with, with this engineer from Spain called Oscar. And that was an interesting time because he had kind of almost forced me to work in the box. So we started doing everything in the computer. And I was like, no, no, this ain't working for me because I need to record instruments in in the right way and I'm not hearing them. And I was really quite frustrated in the studio for quite some time. Uh, I was enjoying myself, you know, but in terms of what I was listening back to, of what I'm enjoying, like playing an instrument and I'm hearing it in a certain way and loving it. And then when I listen back to it in the control room, I'm like, hmm, I'm sure I played better than that. Well, I'm sure my instrument sounded better than that. How comes I'm not hearing that? And that kind of destroyed my confidence of putting out records, actually. That was one aspect. The other second aspect of it was, I remember putting together an album 
2003, I took it to a mastering studio. I'm not going to mention the mastering studio. And great people. Um, and the person who was mastering the record, as the bill was ticking in the mastering studio, he actually said, well, it doesn't matter, Talvin. I said, why not? He said, because everyone's going to listen to it on an MP3. And I just thought, is this what's going on? I'm putting all this hard work in artistically, musically, and sonically, and things are not, it's all distorted out there. The way people are buying music, they're not even buying music, they're renting it. They think they're buying it, this is all, it disheartened me. And I just got on with doing other jobs. And then, you know, I remember Tristan had a studio, uh, at, he had kept a room at the Strong Room um, in Shoreditch. And he said, look, I've got the studio, Talvin, if you need some, you, you know, some time in the studio, just, just let me know. And I love, I used to love, used to love working nights. Uh, I had a reputation of doing like 16, 17 hours a day in the studio. Yeah, I burnt out of quite a few engineers. And, um, and so, <laughs> so Tristan said, look, why don't you just use my studio? So I would go there at nights, like at the strong room, um, I start at like nine o'clock and I'll finish in the morning. And he had uh, this unit there, which I didn't really, I wasn't aware of. Um, but he said, oh, you've got to check this out, you've got to check this out. And, um, and it said, you know, Orpheus and Prism Sound. And I figured it out, what I needed to do, and it was, and everything I was doing in that studio just somehow was exciting me. There was something happening which was exciting. I wasn't recording much because, you know, I got forced to do things inside the computer. But, but obviously when I wanted to record um, essential things like vocals or my drums, uh, percussion, then I would have to do that. And everything I was doing in that studio just sounded amazing. And I was like, this is really, really cool. You've got a good studio. But my attention, my focus was not not on the Orpheus. I just thought his monitoring was great and the room's really good and everything's so, so gorgeous and the studio's brilliant. And then after that, I went back to using whatever I had, a few little bits and bobs, never quite happy. So I got on the phone and I said, look, I've had some kind of situation with a few people and companies and I haven't been happy. And can we please talk? And this voice on the phone, calming voice, therapy, instant therapy is what I felt on the phone. And this person called Mark Evans was on the phone to me and he said, Talvin, of course, I want to come out and I want to go back in, I want to come out, I want to go back in and I want it to sound good. And I was working from home, you know, with a simple computer setup. I was doing, I did the Ford ad for India. Um, I was doing a couple of film jobs. Um, I worked on, I was working with Deepak Chopra, son, uh, who's a wonderful filmmaker, Gautam Chopra. We worked on uh, a lovely documentary film on the history of, uh, of cricket in India, and um, Indian cricket, the history of Indian cricket. And um, so we had fun doing that. And then at the same time, I'm talking to Prism and realized they're not far, so I was already in Suffolk, then Cambridge. I just did these A, B, A, C tests, and I kept on doing them, and I was like bugging people around me and making them basically sit on the hot seat and say, can you close your eyes, and I'm gonna like say, this is A, and this is B, and this is C, and tell me which one sounds better. It's not always that obvious. Uh, but I can tell you some of the things um, in terms of sonic aesthetics, which I definitely felt. Because I'm so close to uh, the tabla, my instrument, and as a percussion instrument, it has a wonderful decay and a note, which makes it very, very unique as a percussion instrument, because it holds a note and it has resonance. And I'm so kind of, it's a part of me, that sound. So I was like, okay, now, now that we've done a kind of 
D to A test, where we're listening to digital music, coming out of the speakers, comparing it with other stuff. Now let's record and see what it also does. And it was unbelievable how the stereo image, which it was holding, was just amazing. Amazing stereo image. And just holding the note together, um, like when you have a sound, um, if you record something, you can easily do like a, what we call a fade out. You know, so if you're not doing a fade out, the, any instrument, the decay at some point will, will, will die down, it'll fade out. And what I found what the prism was doing was it was that fade out, that decay was very natural, the way it was just like, you know, um, falling. And then I did a test with reverbs of like, if I put a reverb on this clap, you know, a synth synthetic reverb, like, you know, one of these uh, digital or, or analog reverbs, I was seeing that it was holding this reverb in a really like smooth, beautiful way. And I was like, right, hold on a second. This is, this is not giving me like, this is not pretending of like, okay, well, it's not dressed. It's not dressed. You know, this is quite naked in terms of like the sonicness is quite naked, which that's what I was looking for because I need that because I love dressing. I love EQs. I love EQs. I, I was born with EQ, you know. I mean, my... my my dad had an amazing stereo when I was a kid, and, and I just had this, ba what we call Baxendor EQ, which was a treble and a bass. And that's when my fidelity had kind of entered my system of like, oh, what happens when you put that bass? What happens when you put that treble? So I started doing mastering stuff when I was a kid or just messing around with EQ. I lo absolutely love EQ. And um, I was like, no, I want to do that stuff. You know, I don't want it done for me. And that's what I really love about the prism, the prism gear.